It's time for the playlist party with your host, Marco Miniman. Well, and good morning here. What's happening now? Are we actually kind of, we are online. We're going to play like, you know, some songs for you. Actually, some of my choices, you know, some music that I grew up with and uh, that I still listen to. And yes, awesome. Hi, hello. And uh, the first song I think, you know, I'd like to play is actually a piece of music, which is, um, well, going to play a tribute to the great Eddie Van Halen. Uh, and it's going to be a song of uh, of a fair warning, which is called Mean Street. And maybe we should play it, and then I'll talk about it actually, and kind of you know tell you why I like that song. So here it comes. <laughs> Aha! So badass. Then. So the thing is, first of all, that guitar intro, what you just heard, was like absolutely badass, you know, like I've never heard anything like that, you know, and it's just this uh, shredding, but it's like, you know, really, uh, also just like, you know, the soul of it, you know, and also the timing, you know, this guy has, or had, well, it's just uh, impeccable, and um, I guess this is like, you know, a perfect example also songwriting rise, you know, there's like, it's not really, like I said, focused on shredding, it's focused more like, you know, on the song and the groove. And I guess that that's what really kind of, you know, made Van Halen uh, so special um, and so unique and different, you know, apart, you know, setting himself actually apart, you know, from all the imposters later on. And so I remember like, you know, listening to that album, uh, my father, uh, bought it and I and I was like when that album came out I was nine years old I guess or, or ten years old and I was actually sitting in front of uh, I was actually sitting in front you know of my stereo kind of putting the record on and the information was immediately there like you know when the guitar solo kind of kicked in you know the, like the guitar intro I thought like a UFO landed or something it was like ridiculous and then you know with that song and the groove and everything about it like the album cover the album artwork is really dark and then uh, it's beautiful, you know. Also, here the guitar solo which comes in right now. Check it out, right? So musical. Right? And also, like, the lyrics are pretty badass on that one, you know. I mean, yeah, you know, Van Halen didn't always have great lyrics, but... <laughs> or he's a commercial band, you know, but uh, some of the stuff is really deep. For example, you know, that stuff that comes up right now towards the end. Uh, here we go. Wait for it. It's so cool, it's so disciplined, you know. And then we go to the outro. Diamond Dave. <laughs> the guest. Here we go. Hey, get back. Get back, class.
that is so cool, right? You know, like the, the dynamics. So I think if the song pretty much has everything, you know, that a rock band, you know, should really have, you know, it's like, um, you know, precision dynamics, good songwriting, and it's just badass overall. So what's not to like? So there you go. That's actually, oh, look at that, you know, like, like the outro. See, that's kind of a thing, you know, some other people would have shredded the piece, uh, to, uh, to pieces, literally, right? You know, and uh, Eddie's just kind of going for the vibe. So bless you, Eddie Van Halen, I guess, you know, that's uh, I'm very happy that I can. Yeah, there you go. So cool. Great. So that was actually that was actually that song. And Van Halen, you know, played like, you know, uh, a big role pretty much, you know, in my life. And um, one of the coolest bands I remember, like, you know, listening to an album uh, after that Diver Down it was called. And I remember going to a record store and um, it was sitting actually there. And I thought like, hmm, I kind of give this a spin and kind of you know, put it on the turntable. And I listened to it and the music was great, but it sounded actually very thin. There was like something going on. And I remember like, you know, kind of going like, hmm, that's kind of weird. I really like this album, but something is missing. And then I saw the stereo system had like all the bass to minus five, like all out and the treble to plus five, you know? So I was like, oh, and then I kind of, you know, turned them back to zero. I was like, holy shit, how good is that? So yeah, that was a little Van Halen anecdote as well. Great, you know, great band. Um, yeah, let's kind of, you know, play some more, you know. So we have like a bunch of songs, I guess, you know. So that is like one of the bands, you know, I really, really like, grew up with and uh, love and always will love. Um, the other thing is like a little more drum focused, I would say, and that would be uh, Achilles' Last Stand by Led Zeppelin, which we probably kind of won't have the possibility to listen to the whole bit, but we should we should definitely kind of listen until uh, the second verse kicks in. Um, there is like this crazy drum fill, you know, which breaks out of the silence, which is so beautiful. So yeah, that's obviously John Bonham. And I have actually really, really cool Led Zeppelin anecdote actually from that particular album, because I know the engineer personally, which is Reinhold Meck, who produced also Queen. But let's kind of give this a go. And uh, first of all, yeah, here we go. Yeah, brilliant guitar intro. Like those two guitars, how they sync up all of a sudden. And the chords are slightly different at the end of the song than in the beginning. You can listen for yourself. And here we go. So good. And I really think, you know, what, what makes it so beautiful is first of all, there was no other band, in my opinion, you know, that sounded like this, like, you know, that big and just like, you know, that defined. But Zeppelin was one of those bands who came fully formed right from the beginning. You know, when you kind of listen to some other bands, you know, they would kind of, you know, need maybe like, you know, two or three albums to find their voice and then kind of, you know, do what they do and kind of have like, you know, that style. But, but Zeppelin, I remember like Led Zeppelin 1 came out, Good Times, Bad Times, they were fully formed. Nothing wrong with them. And with this song here, that's so cool, right? Well, like just the discipline again and the groove and the, and the force of it. And I think what Bonham really does very, very well here in this song is keeping the groove rock solid and the fill never interfere with the vocal. The fills are always kind of musical and kind of just break, you know, basically out of out of the time. Here we go again. And now it goes to the right symbol. So beautiful, you know. And then it's like a little snare displacement. And here come comes the next verse with which has incredible fill. Here we go. And Here's one I like, like a lot, very disciplined, here we go. So good. And here comes my favorite fill. One of my favorite fills of all time. Here we go. Oh, 
How badass was that? How, I, I always get like a kick out of it, right? And maybe we'll wait for one more little bit that goes actually to the next section because he does a really fast, cool pump kill, you know. Also completely unexpected. But beautiful, you know. Hang on. Here it comes. What the fuck was that, right? So, there you go. So, cool, I guess, you know, we won't really have time, you know, for the entire piece, you know, we can probably kind of fade it out, I'd say, you know, but, um, but, uh, so the thing is, with, with uh, Zap, I have actually a very, very cool story about that album. So, uh, Mac, who was the, the engineer for that album, he was kind of, you know, by that time, just coming on the scene. I mean, for the, for those who don't know, actually, Reinhold Mech, he produced or co-produced the game uh, of, of, of uh, from Queen, uh, Flash Gordon, also the works, uh, Hot Space, you know. So he is actually responsible for a lot of the cool stuff they did. And um, he also produced ELO, um, Oh My God, and, and many other bands, Black Sabbath, The Humanizer, which I just listened yesterday, which is actually a pretty good album. And then he engineered Led Zeppelin Presence. And I remember, um, and he, Mac has like this really cool sound. He has like, he can make like a really, um, he, he gets a very good depth, you know, to the songs. And so uh, every production you listen to that Mac is involved sounds actually very rich. I mean, if you listen to another one, Bites of Dust or Dragon Attack or all this kind of stuff, or here, Achilles Last Stand, it kind of speaks for itself, I guess. And um, so the thing, was John Bonham, well, the band came into the studio and he said he was excited, cool, working with Led Zeppelin and he was just a youngster by the time coming just on the scene. <laughs> and he says he started miking Bonham's drum kits, uh, drum set, and then he goes, cool, you know, let's do like a test run, play for me a little bit and then come back to the control room and uh, let me know what you think. So Bonham played and he goes, like, cool, come on back. And he plays back the the track he just kind of you know recorded, and then he goes, he looks at John and goes, "What do you think?" And John Bonham goes like, "Nah, sounds like suitcases." So, uh, well, Mac goes like, "Oh, what can you know? Let's kind of try something different then." And John Bonham was the one he said, going like, "You know what? Let's get more ambience. Let's hang the microphones like a little further away, you know, a little more distant. Let's get a little more room." So Mac did so and kind of did his own thing a little bit as well then and kind of, you know, but it listened to what John Bonham was saying and kind of, you know, uh, obeyed, you know, the magic of the room. And uh, so then he recorded again and then he goes like, okay, now come on back and then listened back again. goes like, what do you think now? And John goes, yep, sounds like big suitcases. So I always kind of you know, like that story. Um, yeah, Bonham Forever, I just saw that. That's uh, true, absolutely. John Bonham, I guess, you know, was one of those drummers. Even the mistakes he rarely made sounded good. It was one of those things when you, you, you know, Ze Zeppelin was a band, you know, who kept like a lot of, you know, lively feeling, you know, like in the recordings. And sometimes if they would screw something up, they would leave the mistakes. Because they sounded like a live band and they sounded like a great live band. So it was like there was never anything awkward or, or, or whoops moment about it. Like, you know, so that was like one thing, you know, about Bonham that I really, really like. Just like a rock solid drummer with like great ideas and a great unique sound. And um, yeah, right on. Cool. And glad that you're chiming in here on and off and kind of talking about things. And here they go. Hello from Indonesia. Hey, that is awesome. Uh, one of our managers actually lives in Indonesia who does actually, who's involved with uh, Max Stein and Miniman, my my new band, or my new duo. And uh, so, yeah, hello. And it brings us to the next song, I guess. You know, we stay with the roots a little bit, or with my roots. Um, here's a song by The Police. Yes. And um, I strangely picked the song One World, which I'll get to it actually a little bit. Well, let me explain first, you know, so I I always liked, you know, how Stuart played on that song because there were like, you know, all those fills going on, but also like, you know, this cool groove and and just just this, I don't know, the, the way they locked was just really magical on that song especially. And um, what surprised me, so I learned actually over the years to literally play 
every fill, you know, because I know this song so well, you know, that, you know, I listen to this album so often that I kind of, you know, pretty much at some point knew every little detail and every little bit. Uh, and then um, I had dinner with Stuart <laughs> and it was a lengthy dinner. Like we talked a lot about the police, about music in general, about life and uh it was great, you know, but then I kind of, you know, we went through over some songs and I kind of, I pointed out that particular song. It's like, man, you know, that drum take was ridiculously good. And and he told me, actually, that was a jam. It was like, that was not even planned. They were just in the studio and just going like, mm, let's jam a little bit. So that's why you're here when you listen to the song. It's literally only one bass riff and drums all over the place and in a good way. And uh, yeah, and some guitar kind of things. And then I guess Sting later on wrote lyrics for that and then tailored a song out of it, right? Made a song out of this. But uh, when we listen to that, you know, just listen to how how great they kind of, you know, are together, how locked they are and how really, you know, intense, you know, that vibe is. So it's like really just a, a, a perfect example for, you know, a very well-oiled machine. And that's what they were by that time, I think. So here we go. One world, not three. Ah, <laughs> oh, fail. Yeah, it has like a reggae feel to it, you know. Sound is great too. Just the, 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 the snare placement, just the way how Stuart really, really plays, you know, like the highest, you know, mainly close. Ah, oh, there you go, yeah. Put the volume down a little bit. And then uh, here come the bell, that's right. Yeah. Just like, you know, every little bit is so musical, you know. I love it, you know, how he places the snare drums and everything. And just, I think, you know, what is really good is that uh, he never keeps the Hyatt too open. The Hyatt is like, you know, nicely closed, you know, so there's a lot of separation, you know, between, you know, the toms, the snare drum, you know, and the cymbals don't bleed too much. Just like a great example for the discipline sound. Yeah, yes, exactly, police, classic. There you go. This fill here, take that. Fucking awesome. Yeah. There's like one thing coming out later a little bit, one of my favorite drum fills, when they go into the breakdown, which is, which is really cool. So much discipline and, and, and love, you know. Now he gets a little crazier. I hear, here come like really cool, like almost slam pulls, but then I don't know. And then he goes like almost into like the shuffle feel, you know, sometimes he kind of mixes the 16th feel a little bit with the shuffle feel. And here comes Hannah. Yeah. Yeah, this is kind of, you know, goes into the last verse, pretty much. Sting on saxophone, by the way. He played, like, saxophone all over the record, and I guess on synchronicity as well, because he he would kind of, you know, Stuart told me Sting is, like, very musical. He goes, like, you know, any instrument he could kind of grab, he would kind of do something, uh, some music with it, you know. So, here we go. And then, here comes a little, little faster fill. Oh, hey, man, how are you doing? From Fly, from Japan, love it. Oh, man, yeah, hey, Joe, what's up, man? 
Yeah. And here comes one of my favorite pills of all time. Hang on. Almost. Almost there. Here we go. Wait for it. And here it comes. Always badass. What a great introduction to the last bit. Here we go. One. How cool is that, right? So there you go. <laughs> Yeah, so there you go. So that was actually the song One World, you know, and the one thing, um, the one world, the one thing Stuart uses a lot is a delay. So we had like a little bit of geeking out actually to do, uh, or not to do, we, we geeked out a little bit, you know, about his playing and, I, and every little thing she does is magic or One World or Death Wish or, you know, a lot of those, you know, walking on the moon. Uh, he uses a delay on the sum of the, drum, of the drum set, right? So, and he says like a lot of people tried to figure out how to play it. What they didn't know, it was a delay. And it, it was including myself when I was a kid and I started to kind of jam along actually every little thing she does is magic. I mean, I have like those two hi-hats here on my drum set, like one here and one over there. So I was like, cool. And try to kind of combine it and kind of get a stereo image going with this. It's cool, you know? I can hear, so you must hope and hear. Yeah, 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 you know, yes, absolutely. Those are influences. Thanks for the comment. Uh, yes, I think, you know, Stuart, uh, John Bonham, Buddy Rich, but also Vinnie Colaiuta, my dear friend Simon Phillips, uh, Dennis Chambers, Michael B., oh, many times overlooked, you know, what a great drummer Michael B. is, just like the sound, the discipline. Barry Morbalo, uh, also like a drummer, you know, who, you know, who's not often talked about, but everybody who knows him knows how great he is, obviously. So those were the drummers I kind of, you know, grew up pretty much, you know, in my youth. And um, yeah, anyways, you know, throw questions at me if you, if you, if you want to, but I can also keep going. I'm not sure, you know, what we are, uh, what else we have on the playlist. We should go to something completely different. Um, so now for something that is, not necessarily drum oriented, but this is also something, you know, I'd like to, I'd like to actually talk about, you know, because I don't consider myself mainly as a drummer. And for the ones who know me writing albums and being involved in productions know also that I'm a guitar player and I started actually with organ with, you know, keyboards. And so the songwriting always comes comes first you know like you know i kind of throw in ideas you know and have like you know a lyrical idea or like a cool riff or anything and then i write a song around it and uh so this is what we're getting to right now i mean the drums thing yes you know uh, but let me tell you a story for the ones who maybe don't know it you know but the reason i got sort of onto the drum scene was because uh modern drama festival or great companies like DW or Zildjian or Promark, you know, started featuring me and started featuring, you know, my drums and kind of had me do clinic tours, you know, while I was doing also with other bands. And I had, I did clinics sometimes and, and I got really on the scene with that, you know, and, and the drummers, I guess us drummers experienced exactly by the time that I sort of got attention, which was like the late, mid, late nineties. Um, I guess, you know, the drummers experienced, you know, that wave exactly that time. Um, that the guitar players had in the mid 80s when like, you know, uh, Steve Vai, Joe Cetriani and Ingvi Malmsteen started to become, you know, started to be featured as guitar shredders or well, they're obviously great players. I don't want to use the word shredding there, but you know what I mean? It was like people were hungry for that. And with uh, us drummers, we really had like, you know, a decade of that from, I guess, 98 until 2010 or something. And then it got a little more musical, which I really like, you know, so now we have like, you know, great chats like this. Or you know, like great, you know, uh, interactions where we kind of show band playing and where we kind of you know do stuff like Drumio does or something really, really, really musical. You know, so I really enjoy that. Um, 
And well, anyways, you know, uh, long story short, let's kind of go into like some deep compositions. So I would kind of, let's play Queen, one of my favorite bands of all time. And there's a good reason, you know, for, for that, because first of all, Queen sound on every album different, completely different. They had the talent or still have, you know, to kind of really turn their world upside down and always kind of come out with like, you know, brilliant stuff. If you listen, <laughs> just like, you know, between, let's say, the album Sheer Heart Attack and then the next one is A Night at the Opera to A Day at the Races to News of the World and then to Jazz, one of my favorite albums of all time. They all sound different or Queen too. You know, it's ridiculous. So, and so you can definitely tell that there's like some really intelligent people at the works, you know, and um, no pun intended, the works was also one of the... <laughs> <laughs> one Queen album. Uh, I mean, Freddie Mercury, obviously super unique. Nobody was like him. Nobody will ever will be. Um, and uh, Brian May, who's an astrophysicist, you know, kind of you know, built his first guitar or his main guitar with his father together. Uh, John Deacon, who was like an uh, uh, electric scientist or something, he built one of actually Brian's apps. And uh, then we have uh, Roger Taylor, who was a dentist. I think you know you studied dentistry and but they're all artsy and freddie studied art and design i think and fashion anyway so uh, uh when they came together you know it was just like this unique sound they created and here's a song which i'm so glad that brian may uh pointed out i was fortunate enough you know to meet brian uh a few times and even do like an online playing thing together he's a super nice guy brian is a absolutely lovely person and um so I really like that he pointed out this very song. He kind of looked back and goes like, the millionaire waltz. He goes like, man, you know, listening back to it, he goes, I have no idea how we did it, but we somehow pulled it off. And you'll hear why that is so. And I'll explain, I'll explain after the song what I, no, actually I should be, I should explain before that song so that you kind of are prepared. So here's the thing. The millionaire waltz doesn't have a click track. You know, meanwhile, you know, all bands play to click tracks left and right. If you have good timing, if you, you know, sometimes the song needs a pace, right? You need, like, you know, this goes in waves, you know, you know. And um, this was a perfect example of, my gosh, you know, how perfectly they really kind of went along, you know, with, you know, the tempo changes and so gracefully and beautifully with the sound. Also, John Deacon uh, on bass plays, like, one of the most perfect, perfect bass takes. Ta I've heard seriously. So, anyways, long story short, listen to this piece and I kind of go into details in a little bit. Wow, right? So what you just hear, like just how the harmonies kind of sometimes resolve. It's ridiculously musical. Here, check out a lot of space, right? And then, and then we pick it up a little bit, like with the, the cold choirs. The bass gets a little busier. To then, really sit back again. And then, here comes actually a bit up to one of the loudest parts, like the most dynamic part in the song. So a very nice preparation for that. And okay, so here comes the midsection.
And this is where it gets really loud. So. And Roger Taylor sounds great on this one too. Hang on. Here we go. Here comes the climax. And now we go into a modulation. Here we go. This is a funny part, but Brian, check out what Brian plays on guitar here. So. Tongue in cheek a little bit, but still beautiful. Here we go. Triangle. Wow, right? It's a masterpiece, that stuff. It's, it's very, literally, theatrical a little bit, right? But it's so, so musical, really. And here's uh, the last... TH. And here comes the, f the final move, man. So. And then. I mean, this guitar parts, those chords, and how the harmonies play with each other, ridiculous. Up up. And here comes the final modulation towards the end of the song. Booms. So there you go. So that's actually one of the reasons why Queen is probably one of my favorite bands because they have all the ingredients actually I like. And uh, I have a, a companion there. I have like a mutual uh, Queen geek, you know, uh, friend who's uh, Dave Kilminster. And he's actually the guitar player from Roger Waters for many years. So every time we find something cool about Queen, we message each other or kind of go like, oh my God, did you see this? <laughs> so recently, I bought the new Blu-ray, actually, that they put out, which is called Around the Life Around the World, and uh, with Adam Lambert, and uh, it's really good. You know, I mean, yes, you know, Adam is not Freddie, but he doesn't want. Uh, he, I mean, he doesn't. He, yeah, he doesn't want to display it that way, and he even says it live. He goes like, "Look, I'm. I don't want to be Freddie, and I'm just so happy to sing those songs." He he really kind of means well, and people should learn to accept that. You know, because they're having fun together, and I watched. You know, this, the Blu-ray. I saw them live together with Adam, actually, as well. I saw them, by the way, live also with Freddie, twice. Like, on the Hot Space Tour and on the Works Tour. But um, Adam does a good job. And so when you watch that DVD or that Blu-ray, it's they still fully got it. I mean, the quality is so high. And I, you know, don't really know many bands, you know, that kept the quality up for so many years so consistently. And I guess it was one of the things that also Brian May said that um, also about Freddie, he says like, you know, whatever he would deliver, no matter in what state he was or whatnot, he said like, you know, he would never have ass things. It would be always as good as possible. And I know <laughs> another anecdote about Queen because, oh my God, I hope Brian doesn't, doesn't watch this. No, it's actually a good one. It's actually cool because Mac, the guy who also engineered Achilles Last Stand and or the, the, the Presence album, he told me the story about when he, <laughs> was working on the game with Queen. And they have a song on that one, which is called Crazy Little Thing Called Love. Great song. 
And Freddie wanted to write a really, really simple song. And he kind of had this acoustic guitar bit. And so he goes, oh my God, I have this whole thing kind of short and sweet song, you know, just like this. And he goes, you know, quick, let's record it before Brian comes in. <laughs> because Brian would be like absolutely analyzing things. He's like, you know, very particular, which is great. Well, obviously you hear that they work together that way, but with Crazy Little Thing Called Love, Freddie wanted to keep exactly that, that basic. He goes like, quick, let's record before Brian comes in and kind of, you know, make something else out of it. But um, anyways, you know, so yeah, any any other questions about that, please chime in or something like that. I'm happy kind of to also answer questions. Great, great comments. I like your comments, but you know, I guess, but anyways, well, we, time actually is running away quickly. We can also play the next song. And this is like a completely left field kind of thing now for, especially for a drum channel, because this is just, you know, something, I don't even know why I picked it, you know, in the first place, because I think it's just one of my favorite pieces of all time, or favorite albums. And uh, therefore it belongs here. So it's actually Kate Bush and, um, I think The Hounds of Love, first of all, the brilliance of this album. This is, by the way, you know, people really don't realize it because the album sounds perfect as it is. But did you actually, when you listen to it, realize that there are hardly any regular played drums on that album? There's like, you know, never really kind of, you know, a snare, hi-hat, you know, kick drum groove or, you know, crashes or whatnot. Actually, something to think about, right? Kate Bush actually worked more like a or works more like an orchestral player. And I remember Peter Gabriel used to do that actually as well, kind of, you know, just avoiding regular drum sets for certain albums. And uh, well, Hounds, Hounds of Love is actually one of these albums, you know, by Kate Bush. And this is actually a song, I guess, you know, one of my, and there's a drummer, yeah, Stuart Elliott is the drummer, you know, but yeah, the way it is set up and played is not regular drum set and you'll hear it. So the thing about uh, Jig of Life, that song, what makes it so beautiful, I guess, um, first of all, it has like a lot of musical diversity to talk about. But instead of kind of what we've been listening to, we have been listening to rock, to reggae with a little bit of a wave, you know, punk to it. Then we listen to, uh, to more like theatrical stuff by Queen. And now we're gonna listen to folk. So this is really folk based, you know, England. And um, so, so the Jig of Life actually, the whole side two of Hounds of Love is called um, The Ninth Wave. And it is about her dying, actually, about her drowning, you know. So basically, she's skating on ice and breaks through the ice and then drowns, is getting saved, but is in a coma, I guess, or something. And she has like all those visions and kind of, you know, dealing with life and death. And Jig of Life is, is, a, is a really deep tune if you listen to that. It's basically her dealing out that she wants to live. And the other side says, like, no, you belong to me. And um, just the way it's paced is so haunting and beautiful. So let's, I guess, you know, let's go into that song. I talked long enough. Hello, lady. Oh, blimey. Here comes like a very interesting, interesting harmonic movement, always at the very end, which is very happy first and then it gets very dark by one note only. Here it comes. Right? It causes a great tension. That's a really dark lyrics, man. It belongs to me and your little boy and your little girl on the one hand clapping there when your palm is my little line when you're written in mine is no one that we It comes in one note again. Wait. Here 
Here come. And now the midsection, modulation. Three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And this is turning almost into like a drum core thing. You'll hear it in a second. And the way it builds, it gets more intense. Every section gets more intense. Here come like the rims and then the drums, and then they insert a bar as well. Uh, almost, that was earlier. One, two, three, four, five, six. So there's always like a six insert. Here comes the drums. Yeah, that's when the awesome. Four, five, six. Two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three. One, two, three. Two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, six, one. Right? And one more one more way around. Brilliant. Written out written out piece, you know. Now the end section. Back to the theme, main theme. Can't you see where memories are kept bright? Tripping on the water like a laughing girl. Time in her eyes is spawning past life. Wrong on the ocean and the woman unfurls. Holding all the love that waits for you here. Catch us now, for I am your future. A kiss on the wind and we'll make the land. Come over here to where. When yes, absolutely. Waiting in this empty world, waiting for them when the life spray cools. From now does ride in on the curl of a wave, and you will dance me in the sunlit pools. We're of the going water and the gone. We are of water and the holy land of water, and all that's to come cool. runs in with the thrust of the strand. Great, right? So there you go. So that was the Kate Bush tune. But yes, as um, Michael Lang was uh, was just kind of chiming in, it is absolutely correct. You know, he kind of pointed out, you know, that English folk uh, has has actually a lot of like Irish folk, English or Scottish roots music, like everything. You know, the Gaelic and you know Wales. You know, they have like each their different dialect. You know, in places and just unbelievably beautiful uh, uh, folk folklore. And so. Uh, indeed, like great rhythm, rhythmic movements, but also harmonically. You know, it gets like it's sometimes really dark. You know, but but beautifully dark. You know, so yeah, I can really kind of identify myself with that a lot. <laughs> Me coming from Europe, from a colder country, like you know, from the north of Germany, and we have like you know some Viking roots, you know, in our family and everything there. So yeah, I can kind of absolutely, you know, get the vibe. I love that. Uh, now, yes, you know, so we talked actually a lot about this music. I guess, you know, we're almost done here unless you kind of throw something at me like a question or whatnot. You know, I'm happy to go into details. But that was my little morning coffee playlist sharing some of my favorite bands and artists with you. And uh, there are many more, you know, obviously I could have played something from by Frank Zappa, you know, one of my biggest influences. Uh, uh, or from Rush or Jethro Tull, you know, ACDC or, you know, Kraftwerk. I wanted to play something from Kraftwerk as well, right? But um, so, yeah, I don't know. Uh, maybe maybe this is it, unless we want to do one more song. I'm going to, you know, ask like our wonderful host from DW here like that. Shall we do like one more song? Shall I explain Kraftwerk? And we play Kraftwerk. Can we pull that off? No? Yes? Ah, okay. They would they would need to open it up now. Well, meanwhile, I can do like go for it. Meanwhile, I can do some shameless. <laughs> oh yeah, it's called here. I say it out loud. Numbers by Kraftwerk from an album called Computer World. So, what I really kind of you know like about the Numbers song, uh, or actually about Kraftwerk in general. First of all, it's another dedication because one of the main guys 
Florian Schneider just passed away a few months ago. So we lost, my God, we lost like great people this year, didn't we? First, Neil Peart, you know, uh, well, yeah, Florian Schneider and, well, Eddie Van Halen. Gosh, you know, so kind of saddening, but, you know, I would love to kind of talk about this a little bit. So here's the genius from Kraftwerk, what I think was um, not only that they kind of created a whole new style of music and uh, they kind of com completely built their own instruments. Now, when you listen to it, you know, it, it, it's still, there's still some brilliant stuff in it. Nobody sounds like them. It was just absolutely unique. And exactly by the time, imagine in the 70s, you know, coming out with something that sounds like today's techno or electronic. There was nothing like it. And still to this day, it's almost, it, I think it's unmatched because they used to build their own instruments, well, with the help of like Dupfer modular systems and all those kind of things, you know, but a lot of the stuff was literally self built. And um, so, and also no MIDI. Therefore, also no quantizing. So they played those instruments and it sounded just accurate and tight and beautiful and they influenced just generations upon generations. I remember there was a story um, about David Bowie. He liked them a lot. David Bowie was a, a huge Kraftwerk fan. And when they did an album called Trans Europe Express, uh, that was when... David Bowie, before that album happened, he wanted to have them as his band. And uh, he said, like, oh, we, he wanted to collaborate with them. And Kraftwerk, since they just kind of designed that we are robots, you know, and, you know, we're, we, 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 we have this mystique, you know, we, we, are, we can't be seen and nobody knows us, you know, this whole kind of thing. Um, uh, they said no. And I remember, like, two of the band members really regretted it. I know one guy said, like, man, I always regretted that we never worked with David Bowie and he really wanted it, you know. And Ralf Hütter and Florian Schneider, the main guy, said, like, nope, we can't. This is our concept. We're going to pull Kraftwerk through. And, well, you know, they were actually kind of right, weren't they? But David Bowie did an album and paid tribute to Kraftwerk and used a lot of the sounds that sounded like them, which is called Low. And he has actually even a tribute already uh, to Florian Schneider when he was alive, which he called V2 Schneider. So that was dedicated to Florian Schneider from Kraftwerk. And, uh, well, long story short now, so let's kind of play that song. And, uh, and, and, you know, the thing is, what I really like about this tune, just how direct the sounds are. You know, well, I'm mimicking the drum set, but there is no drum set. But just like, you know, you'll, you'll see that a lot of people sampled or tried to recreate, you know, this soundscape. And um, another thing which I really like about the song is the simplicity, but the force that it projects. So they were building their own voice computers by that time. And so that song, this is why it's called Numbers, is literally just counting. So I think they're counting only most of the time until eight or until four in different languages in a stereo way by different computer voices. And that's, that's all. But listen to it and find out for yourself. And those sounds, you know, when you listen to when you listen to this on the original vinyl or over headphones or your car speakers, this sounds really fat. On the computer, it, it won't really do it justice. But uh, those sounds, the electronic sounds are so direct and so in your face. It's like different than just like regular MIDI sounds. So you hear it, it's analog, analog electronic. There we go. Thank you, Marcus. Here comes that thing, and it's supposed to be a Hyatt, and it sounds so wonderful. Check it out. So. It's 
Brilliant. It's fucking great. So, so yeah, the concept. Oh, here we go. That this this thing is coming up now. The the little impulse. It's like impulses basically that they work with. Uh, it's almost kind of you know coming towards the end here right now, but it's. So yeah, and 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 the ones who have ever seen Kraftwerk live, you know, know actually well how genius this whole kind of thing is. The concept just appearing as robots and just being like you know so pure, you know. There's like a beauty to it, you know, and um, there's an aesthetic to it. I guess what Kraftwerk has. There we go. Russian, and Japanese. And very unusual stuff isn't it you know but i love it you know and and i'm so glad you know that bands like like these guys made it because they're so unique and and, and out of outside the box right which is which is great think left field sometimes it's beautiful there you go so yeah i guess you know now we had like you know all sorts of styles of music you know on this playlist and uh thank you so much you know for being part of this and now i'm gonna probably play like some more drums and writing on a new song actually right now Oh yeah, and our new album with Randy McStein together, actually what I'm doing is coming out very soon on December 4th. It's already up for pre-order. You can watch videos on my, you know, Instagram or, yeah, there you go. Oh, perfect. Or Facebook or whatever you can find. <laughs> My God, you guys are quick. Um, and so, yeah, you know, have fun and thanks so much. Uh, uh, yeah, exactly. Watch out for McStein and Miniman part two. And also October 27th. As you can see, 10 a.m. Pacific time again with Gerald Hayward. So thank you so much for being part of this cool little hang. Hope you enjoyed it. Good morning or good afternoon, wherever you are.